Hi, kitty cats. I am Amethysta Herrick, your hostess for Gender Identity Weekly, a weekly discussion about identity and gender from the contributors and guests of the Purple Paw Publications website, Gender Identity Today. This content is brought to you by subscribers of Gender Identity Today. If you're already a subscriber to Gender Identity Today, thank you so much for your ongoing support, because subscribers not only receive an email in their inboxes every time new content is uh, published, but they're also able to interact with every contributor directly on the website, and that even includes me. So if you wanted to talk to me, huh? I think that's a, that's a, a perk right there. So if you would like to support shows just like this one, as well as other podcasts, other videos, and all the written articles by our contributors, I urge you to consider subscribing using the links that you're going to find in the show notes. Well, today it is my distinct honor to be speaking with Lindsay Law. Hi, Lindsay. Good morning. I got to tell you, I, you know what, let me do the intro. Here's the, here, let me tell you about Lindsay. Gosh, I'm so honored that I'm stuttering, right? Lindsay is an executive producer and also a producer, at least has been, in television, film, and theater. Lindsay was also the president of Fox Searchlight Pictures, which I got questions to ask, and most recently uh, became a novelist, which is very cool. Um, the way I see it, uh, if I look through your career, I see you telling stories of I want to say the uncommon human experience, because, you know, we see stories of, of, you know, the common human experience, like, you know, X-Men, you know, <laughs> the common human experience all the time. But these are stories that really need to be told. And, and I guess I'm, I mean, I'll start off just by saying thank you so much for, for telling some of these stories. Um, I want to start off with a question that I think is going to be a bit open ended, but Bear with me a little bit here, because I because I want to let me tick off some of your accomplishments. You were executive producer for American Playhouse, f pretty much on the whole run, nineteen eighty one to nineteen ninety five. Um, I want to tell you, much of American Playhouse is kind of formative to, like me growing up. I mean, it was stunning to look over all of the things that that American. Uh, Playhouse did stories about J. Robert Oppenheimer, Huckleberry Finn, not not you know well liked today. Bernard Getz was another uh, the subway shooter, a New York subway shooter in the in the nineteen eighties. Um, the calculus teacher who inspired the film Stand and Deliver, which was originally an American Playhouse uh, film. The psychiatrist that inspired the Thin Blue Line, and I mean one one of the big ones. Tony Kushner's Angels in America. I mean, you had a part in 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 producing all of these stories. I I will also mention Overdrawn at the Memory Bank. Hmm. Yeah. But it was a good you know good Raul Julia v vehicle, right? Yeah. So. Angels in I, America is not part of American Playhouse. I'm not sure where that comes. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. Well, there was a Broadway. You're right. There was a there was a Broadway um, rendering, I believe. But um, forgive me uh, if if I got that wrong. Forgive me. Um, but I I want to ask. So I mean, as EP, you got to choose some of these projects, right? Um, yeah. During your career, how do you make these choices? How do you choose the projects that you did, and, wh and why? Um, American Players was specifically created to bring American drama um, to public television. So that was the first criteria, that, that the work be American, either the subject matter or the creator, um, the writer. Um, um, uh, so that, that was the first. The, the second was just, you know, what's a good story? Does it, does it, does it you know, are you, are you in, in enthralled by it? Now, the plays are one thing. I mean, it, 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 we did plays, we did short stories, we did novels. The plays w were a simpler choice, just pick some great American plays. Um, yeah. so, and so we did a huge number of, of plays. Um, um, every, every, I think actually every famous American playwright was represented um, on American Playhouse, but it was the short stories or the originals that are, that are more challenging in terms of, I mean, you mentioned, for example, Stand and Deliver. Um, right. 
That was a script that um, two young men sent to me. Um, it was based on a real life story of a teacher, indeed, in Los Angeles. Yep. And reading it, I thought it was, I, I just, I have never read this story. I don't know this. This is new. This is interesting. This is a completely Hispanic tale, um, which is probably why I didn't know it. Um, um, and I thought, well, public television was definitely um, um, in the, in the, in the um, 70s. Um, um, I don't mean the 70s. I mean, what? What year? The 80s. Sorry, it's the 1980s. It was definitely looking to reach out and broaden its horizon. I mean, as, as many right. could complain, like much of television, it was very white. Um, yes. uh, there were very good, um, well-meaning steps to try to correct that. Um, and programs, stories like Stand and Deliver were part of that, um, um, to bring the lives of people, of all people, to the American population and to let them see, listen, here, these are your brothers and sisters. They're not just white people. Yes. Oh, my gosh. When that film came out, when Stand and Deliver came out, because Edward James Olmos yeah. was, not a, was not a huge actor. I would say. In fact, actually, that also had um, Lou Diamond Phillips, if I remember correctly, right? Yes. So who went on to do La Bamba? And I mean, you know, the two, it was an interesting sort of, sort of a juxtaposition because Ricky Valens was, was born, you know, in the San Fernando Valley and stand and deliver. I forget the name of the school, but the, the calculus teacher was in that North, it was North Valley. And I mean, it, you know, so many stories of, well, I mean, very close to where I grew up and, and I, it was so inspiring really to see. I'm going to feel like I'm gushing here, but it was like this. These are like stories right next to me, like down the street. And and it was amazing. So. But you also chose some challenging topics. I mean, Bernard Getz, I forget the psychiatrist actually who did the who who uh, Dr. Death, the thin blue line guy. Yes. Names not come. Th those are challenging topics. Yeah, Doctor Death. Yeah, he was. Um, 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 yeah, that's a scary character. Oh my uh, gosh! Yeah, Errol, Errol Morris is an amazing filmmaker, a documentarian, um, uh, and this was, I think, his second or third documentary. He's just finished his most recent one was on on um, John Le Carre, which is um, uh, was wow. out, was out as a movie just recently. Wonderful. He so he's still creating valuable work, but in that one, he had gone and interviewed a prisoner in the, in the Texas jail system. Yeah. Um, who was on death row. And he was not surprised to hear that the prisoner claimed he was innocent. And yet he's recording him and filming it. And he became quite convinced that indeed he was innocent. Right. Errol, Errol, who's the filmmaker, Errol brought the footage to me and he said, I think this could be an amazing basis for a film. And I watched the footage and I said, no, you can't make a film out of this because this guy you're interviewing, the prisoner, the guy can, uh, who's sitting on death row, he's fascinating. I said, I can't imagine an actor being as interesting as this guy because um, of the way he spoke, the way his language, the way he created words and formed words. He was, he was a fascinating fellow. I said, why don't you just use all this footage? Keep going back to that. He said, you mean make a documentary? I said, yes. He said, but American Playhouse doesn't do documentaries. I said, well, not until today. <laughs> and so we went ahead and provided the funding for him to, it took another two years for him to put yeah. the whole, create the film, but um, that film got him out of jail. He was freed from prison. Right, right. Um, yeah. No, that's and a fat story. But, but that's what storytelling can do. Good storytelling has yeah. an impact that goes way beyond um, um, just the material. Oh, very much. I mean, I think actually that film was also, or that documentary was also instrumental in some of the, the um, capital punishment like reform that we saw toward the end of the 1980s. I don't remember the, the, when that was uh, released, but, you know, there was a big capital punishment reform certainly during the Clinton era that, um, yeah, I know that that helped drive some of it. I mean, just Yes, and that film is taught, and a lot of law schools use the film as a te as a teaching um, tool. Yeah, I, w I had a curiosity. Do you know what happened to the psychiatrist? 
after that. Who do you mean by the psychiatrist? Dr. Death, you mean? D- Dr. Death, yeah. Was he a uh, psychologist or was he a psychiatrist? I can't remember. I can't remember. Okay. I don't know what happened to him. He can. I actually don't know what happened to him. Okay. Um, famous for, he was the man, just so your, your, your listeners understand, yes. he was who the courts in Texas, if you were found guilty of a certain crime, especially murder, um, um, you were then taken to Dr. Death. He had a real name, which I'm forgetting. And that doctor would decide whether you were fit to stand trial. Um, he would decide whether you're a crazy person or you're not a crazy person. And he would recommend, um, um, if you were found guilty of something like murder, he would recommend whether you should be put away for the rest of your life or whether you should be killed. And that's why the terrible nickname of Dr. Death, because he always said, oh, just, you know, send him, execute Death penalty. Yeah. yeah. He executed and I- I want to say I forget exactly, but I, I want to say there were two a good two hundred cases for for which he consulted two hundred people that he recommended for the death penalty. Which whew, wow, I uh, mean, I don't like, remember any longer. This was a long. This is a long time ago that we yeah, made. The, um, I mean, what a what a it was a crazy story though. So. Now, I, now I left one of my favorites for last here, so, um, because as you, when you were president, so you were president also of Fox Searchlight Pictures, and and uh, can you tell us actually first of all, because it's a, there was a, a subsidiary of Twentieth Century Fox, was that right? It was it was the art film um, um, division. Okay. Fox. Um, at that point in time, many of the studios had art film divisions. Um, um, Sony has Sony Classics. Um, sure. Disney had Miramax. Um, so um, the large studios saw real value in having a completely different group of people to create, market, and distribute films for what was described as you know, the art film audience, I guess. Yeah. That's what Fox Searchlight Pictures was, um, um, the art film division of 20th Century Fox, which is a very large, was at that time a very large studio. Well, of course. And and as president, I mean, this you would have greenlit pretty much right. every story there, right? So um, in the late 1990s, mid to late 1990s, there was the Hillary Swank film, Boys Don't Cry. Yes. I'm going to start to cry already, which doesn't matter because I'm not a boy. In part, let me see if I can get this out, in part because I saw that film... Sorry, my goodness. But I saw that film and it was a real portrayal of a real transgender person. And um, anyway, it was not that long after I saw that film that I actually uh, started looking at transitioning gender myself. I knew I was going to 20 years before I saw that film. Well, not 20, but 15 years before I saw the film. I'm still having trouble talking. I'm sorry. Um... What a formative, formative film for me, and I know for many of my brothers and sisters, transgender brothers and sisters, how in the world did you greenlight that? What, what, how did that go through? That's an, that's an interesting story that I hope I can tell clearly. Um, at Fox Searchlight, we had initially decided to go ahead and script a story based on this tale. Yeah. And it was um, two very well-known actresses. Um, One was going to play the lead and one was going to produce it. I'm not going to mention who they are. Um, (laughs) Brought brought the story to us. And and we were developing a script based on it. And we had difficulty in the development stage because these two persons who were in charge of, you know, they were the people we were trusting with creating it kept delaying the important decisions, like who should be write it, who should... Anyway, it was taking a very long time. And meanwhile, there was another project out there in the universe, um, and and it was being headed up by a producer I knew very well and admired very well and had worked with many times, um, and Christine Vachon, who's created an amazing number of, of, of gay and lesbian stories for the screen, and she was developing the same story about oh. Brandon. 
Yeah. I went and met with her in New York and had lunch with her. And I was trying, I, I, I was having the lunch to try to convince her to come and take on our project and drop her project. And as we had the lunch, because I lived at that point in Los Angeles, she lived in New York, I hadn't seen her for a while. I was suddenly reminded of how wonderful she was and talented, how much I liked her. And I thought, why would I convince her to come and go into the lion's den with these other producers who I thought weren't actually, it wasn't going well. Okay, so a few months goes by. She finishes her film. She sends me a clip of it, um, just a small edited piece. The film was still being edited. And um, because Searchlight also acquired films that we didn't necessarily make, but that other people made them, but we acquired them to put them into distribution and get them into movie theaters in your neighborhood. So she showed me a clip of it, and I immediately offered to buy the film for Mm -hmm. Searchlight. Um, and this was at the Sundance Film Festival. And then other people got in on it, and they, everyone was seeing the footage. And Hilary Swank was in the early, in the footage, in this very early clip, which no one, you know, which is, this was the first time we're all seeing her. She was unbelievable um, in this movie. And you just thought, well, this is, this is, this is going to get people. This will bring people in because this is so real and so truthful and so moving. Um, um, so anyway, so we, we, we actually dropped the other project because you can't do two films on the same subject. Sure. Um, this project was obviously the superior project because of Hillary Swank. And, um, and we went ahead and distributed that instead. Um, and the other project n- never came to fruition, needless to say. Right, right. I don't. I think you said it very well that Hillary Swank was was so real in that performance. I don't think I had ever seen a what's the word I want to use? A sensitive portrayal of a transgender character before then. Yeah. They, they, yeah, the, the the movie screens and television screens were not exactly filled with transgender characters. I mean, we're no. talking this is 1998, 1999. Yeah. Um, um, so, no. Yeah. It was, it was amazing. And, and like I said, a very formative for me. Because it was 2001, actually, that I started looking into uh-huh. gender transition. That was in Los Angeles, by the way, which, which it wasn't easy. It took me another 20 years to pull it off. But, you know, I still think back on that film and and uh so amazing and i guess i'm just trying to say thank you for 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 bringing that to us all oh i'm getting chills um before i cry again let me move on yes. <laughs> because these are i said at the very beginning i said these are the stories that must be told or i'm trying to think of how i put it and i hope it was you know eloquent the stories that must be told, and I think that was one of them. But you have now shifted from from producing stories now to creating your own. Yes. And so you've written your own novel, and I, and I you know, let me—it's the Orphan from Shepherd's Keep, and available on all kinds of uh, all kinds of um, um, distribution channels. Now we'll link to that, by the way, in the show notes to the book. Can you can you explain to me like why why did you make that shift? Why did you shift from producing stories to to creating? Most of my career was spent helping, assisting um, other people bringing stories they wanted to tell um, to fruition. So screenwriters who would bring me an idea or a script, or novelists who thought their novel could make a good movie, whatever. It was always other people's creations and i and i love producing i'm producing films and tv shows was a very fulfilling career and i enjoyed it immensely um um but it's also a hard career and it requires um, um your full effort to you know to, to 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 be successful at it um but there were also stories i had in my head that i wanted to tell um but there wasn't time to work that out i mean you, to, to be a writer you need to have time to just sit and, and write. And I didn't have time. I was producing. Anyway, I see. after I retired, suddenly time was this beautiful commodity that was available to me. And I thought, let's try telling a tale, a story that people might want to hear. And what led me to it was, was my growing up. Because when I grew up, um, 
there was there were no stories out there, whether it was on the television shows I was watching, whether it was in the novels I was reading, whether it was in the films in my local film theater. Um, there were no stories documenting the lives, um, dramatizing the lives of gay people. They just they just didn't exist when I was growing up. And when and when they did occasionally um, um, show up, it was always in a very depressing form. It was yes. always the, the character ended up committing suicide, or they were miserable for the rest of their lives, or you know, or they forced themselves to become something they weren't and right. pretend happy anyway they were these were terrible um, um, guideposts for young people to see um, and I I could argue that I mean something as silly as um, um, oh I'm gonna go blank on the name um, um, what's the wildly popular sitcom will and grace I could argue oh. that will and grace conceivably did more for introducing gay people to the rest of America than anything else um, 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 meaning it had a huge audience. Gay people were invited into the homes of all of America, and yeah. they would watch and think, this isn't so threatening. This isn't so terrible. These are fun people. I like these people. I recognize these people. They're like my sons or daughters or what? So, I mean, literally, a, a, a sitcom who was just trying to make us laugh um, became conceivably, in my mind, so, suddenly a huge change. Um, now, granted, if wasn't it wasn't dealing in 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 subjects of enormous import but it was just no. characters week after week and hear what was on their mind and they were a different group of people than are necessarily living down the street from so, right and and certainly certainly yeah. a step up to, i mean because you presumably you remember the um the premise of three's company right yeah. You know, jack yeah jack tripper was supposed to be gay and it was only a foil for jokes, you know, so that Jack would be like, wow, that's a pretty looking uh, guy standing next to the girl, Mr. Roper, because certainly I wouldn't. And you're like, ha. Uh, yes. <laughs> no, it was, it was it, 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 these stories, these stories didn't, they literally didn't exist. I mean, it's, it's when I was in my 20s, I think. Um, um, I read the E.M. Forster novel, Morris, mm. turned into a beautiful um, Merchant Ivory film with Hugh Grant. But um, um, he wrote it in 1914, but refused to allow it to be published until his death. So it wasn't published until the early 1970s. And I think it's got to be one of the very first gay love stories with a happy ending, because you never saw that. If you saw gay characters at all, one of them was always going to be dead by the end. Sure. And so this is, you know, this is for for a kid growing up and 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 searching your sexual identity and and these thoughts that are occurring to you, trying to find an equivalent of that, trying to find somebody like that out there in the media universe, uh, uh, just didn't exist. So literally, I started writing the book with that in mind. I wanted to write a book that I wished I could have read when I was a teenager, when I was in my 20s, when I was in my 30s. Meaning I wanted to see a characters, I wanted to see characters who were gay, but the storyline wasn't because they were gay. They happened to be gay. Gay happened to be a quality that defined them in the same way that blonde hair defined them, or they had funny little fingers that defined them, whatever. They, gay wasn't the reason for the story. It was just a quality that they possessed, along with many others. That that was what was important to me, and then the, I find the characters um, and friends who have commented to me on the book. Um, that's one of its strong points. It's it's a book that'll break your heart, but it doesn't break your heart because they're gay. It breaks your heart because these are real people who happen to be gay. You know, I've had several conversations recently about representation. You know, yeah. I, I you know, and, and one of them in particular, LGBTQ representation in in marketing, um, as well as, as in fiction and what you said mirrors a lot of what, you know, we keep on trying to say that, that you, that you don't want, you don't want stories about gay people. You want stories about people who also are gay, Correct. good stories that about people who are gay and it contributes to the story, but the story isn't a vehicle for, look, let me display gayness. Right. 
So, so what, I mean, I think that's a great point. I mean, you know, I think that there's a lot of tokenism that you'll find to us. You brought up will and grace. I mean, to a certain extent, it, it was a little bit similar to three's company in that it was sort of like, well, we're, the gayness was a bit of a vehicle. Like, we want to show you, look, these are gay people. And yeah, it invited it into, you know, people's homes. And I do agree. I think that that was a stunning vehicle. You know, it was it was one of those things that normalized being gay after, gosh, you know, in the 1980s when, when you know, AIDS was the gay disease and, and you know, there was a scourge upon gay men, of course, because we needn't go there. So it was nice to see that as kind of swinging the pendulum back to say, no, there are stories about people who are gay who aren't like horrible, sinful people who are going to, you know, again, I didn't go there. I was trying not to. So, mm -hmm. so I appreciate that. That's a huge, that's a huge um, milestone in, in literature to be able to tell stories in which, you know, being gay is not the story, but, but yes. only a part of it. So. You know, with, 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 and with, with streaming services now, with so much content being created um, to fill the need of these, you know, of Netflix and Hulu and Disney plus and Paramount plus, I mean, all these services, all this new programming that must be created um, to fill these hours um, um, a lot of it is being filled with 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 gay programming, with gay characters, um, um, and it's it's no one even thinks twice about it now. I mean, if I, I I I I'm I'm in my seventies, so um, um, to me this is still astonishing. I think to a twenty year old or a thirty year old at the moment, they just take it for granted. I mean, wh of course, why wouldn't these stories be on television? I mean, here we all are. We're a percentage of the population. Our story should be on television. That was not a given in the 60s, 70s. Oh, no. The only time you would you would see a network television production with a gay character in it would be something, you know, like an early frost or something. And the entire headline was about a young man who has to tell his parents he's going to die because he has AIDS or what. You know, it was always going to be some terrible, terrible story. And all the focus would be on that one thing. And that would be the one gay character on television for the entire year. Um, it was really, and, and of course it was some terrible, terrible, sad story. Um, I mean, that's why the GLAAD Awards were finally created to, to try to encourage producers and storytellers to create more stories. Let us please thank you with them and, and, and reward you with an award because this is still so rare. Um, right. So it's it's um, um, it was yeah it was a long it was a long time it was a long time in coming, right? I and remember it was the AIDS epidemic that that really did um, provide the impetus though. I mean, I mean, writers writers were writing memoirs of how their lover mm -hmm. died. People were writing stuff, but whatever. It, there was a burst of of literature and television and films dealing with with the crisis. And from that finally became a body of work that people, you know, a much larger body of work than had previously existed um, that said these people exist. Right. Which turned into political action. I mean, and, you know, as a great example, I mean, Tony Kushner's Angels in America, right? The story that followed that, um, not senator, I think he was a representative, but... And I don't, you know, factual or not, it doesn't make a difference. The point is, you know, the 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 story was there so that it could be perceived at all. Um, I want to throw a counterpoint out here because yeah. I was um, ask you the question, because if you, you know, supposedly generous um, estimates, if you were to put squish together all of the, the letters in LGBT and Q, and, it, you know, the acronym keeps growing, but uh, many people say, or at least, you know, there have been people who have said, if you squish all those together, you're talking about 10% of the population. I, I think that is a ludicrously low estimate for what it's worth. That's my take, and that's a lot of where my work goes. But so why should we make films for 10% of the population? What's the point? I guess, as, as a friend of mine would put it, what's the margin in it? 
Well, why else? Why else are you telling stories? I mean, uh, that hundred um, percent—that doesn't suddenly mean if you're saying it's twenty percent or eighteen percent or ten percent, whatever percent is. And I don't trust any of those numbers. But that doesn't mean suddenly that the ninety percent we're not talking about then is all one group. That ninety percent is not one group either. That ninety percent is many, many, many other ten percent, five percent, three percent. Whether it's you know Hispanic people, whether it's black people, whether it's immigrants, whether it's I mean w- w- there are many many different elements that make up this earth, and all their stories deserve to be told, and it shouldn't. And who decides to tell those stories? Luckily, is changing enormously. I mean, there used to just be white men at the top of the hierarchies of publishing companies and television networks and film companies, and that is changing enormously. Um, um, and thus, the new people running these companies make different choices because they lead different kinds of lives. Um, and that's, that's just, that's just a blessing for all of us. I agree. I think it, it enriches all of our lives to see as many stories as we can. Yeah. That was a beautiful answer. Thank you. I three, I, I wasn't sure if I was going to throw you like a soft lob or like a fast curveball, but either way you knocked it out of the park. Okay. Perfect. Um, I, an inter, I want, you have had a long and illustrious career and we've spoken only a tiny bit about your book. And I want to know, you know, more about the book is, did the book become a, a summation of all the lessons you've learned from all the stories you've brought into existence? No, you can't, you can't, I mean, for something to be, to tell a truthful story, you've got to be very specific and you've got to. You got to kind of zero in on um, the the characters you're going to create, and those characters can't represent everything. Um, they True. can't be lovely and angry and hateful and ugly and beautiful. They can't be everything. You've got to decide who are these people, um, and so it is an accumulation of of my life. Meaning, this is how people behave. Um, um, this is how people respond to one another, but. It doesn't incorporate all the different kinds of responses and characters that could indeed people. It. I mean, I'm re- I'm working on a second book at the moment, and the, and it's a very different group of people in this one. Um, um, uh, again, I hope they're informed by by the life I've lived, and I hope it, they're informed by the lessons I've learned in terms of incorporating um, universal themes that no matter who you are, we suffer and celebrate. Um, um, many of the same things together as opposed to we're different from one another we've got to realize how similar we are to one another we should find the things that 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 as opposed to make us different and then separate us from one another we should find those things that that uh, uh, that we share Um, um, and and that's to me that's so that hopefully that's what's informing my storytelling Um, and I find um, uh, uh, one of the quotes that someone mentioned for the book, I, I love because he suddenly said, this book stole my heart. And to me, that's a perfect description of what I would hope to do as a writer. He wanted, I wanted to steal your heart. I mean, meaning he fell in love with these people. I had a note last night from a friend I worked with years ago. And she wrote and said, your book was waiting on my doorstep when I got home. I started reading it, but I'd been on a very long flight and I had to put it down and was furious I couldn't finish it. I finished it the next day and, oh uh, 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 and I now miss these people terribly. Please write a sequel <laughs> because she missed these characters in her life. They became very real to her. So again, these are, these are writers hope to hear such words. Um, mm-hmm. So I've been by that, that people have indeed written to me saying that these characters touch them in a very real and deep way. And I, you know, the question I asked was, is, is your book a summation? And you said, no, we need to hear all of these stories. And in a way, it's not a summation, but rather just a further implementation of yeah. what you've been doing for, yeah. for years, tell, telling the stories need to be told. So that's a good way of putting it. Yes. Did, um, I love, I love fiction writers because do, do all the, um, I've got to figure out how I want to ask this question because fiction writers tend to, these are like real voices. Let me stop stuttering. The characters, were they more or less 
like voices in your head. I don't know how to put this. Are there all, are they all aspects of yourself that you uh, wrote? Um, <clears throat> that's yeah. That's an, are the aspects of myself. There's certainly things I'm familiar with, um, and yes, I must see these things within my own self, um, whether they're good things or bad things. Um, the, the events that take place in the book, I've not experienced all the events. I, I, mm -hmm. I make um, um, some of them I've experienced personally, some, some I've never experienced. Um, some of the cities that the book uh, uh, takes place in a wide variety of, of different European cities, um, um, in addition to uh, northern Vermont. And um, many of those cities I've never been to. Um, so it's your imagination that's leading the way. Um, and these characters, they change over time. Um, there's kind of a bad boy character in the book. We meet him when he's a young, young man, a teenager. And as he grew older, he became less and less and less of a bad boy. And mm -hmm. I, I began understanding more about him. And, and, and of course, as he grew older, because the book takes place over a 30 year period. So as we, the reader, watch him grow, he, um, he changed enormously. And I said, I thought, I, I actually can, I, I now like this guy. We didn't like him when we first met him. He was an opportunist and selfish and mean. Um, uh, and those are qualities. That we all know lots of people have those qualities and they can be seductive sure. qualities too. <clears throat> um, um, <clears throat> excuse me. But, um, but over time and over the time that the book takes, um, 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 I found, I found affection for him. And so of course I would change I changed some of the things to make him, to make the to make the reader uh, not hate him, uh, but understand him. Sure. Well, I mean, I I think of fiction and this. I think of just actually telling stories. Forget about you know whatever the stories are. It ends up being an exploration of our own identity, and, and actually reading stories and telling stories. I think I think experiencing the stories. It ends up being an exploration of her own identity. You you got to play, you know, this somewhat conniving character, at least in your head. Yes. Which is a very valuable, you know, exploration of yourself that that will probably, you know, inform further writing. The thing that's always surprising, though, and I think people who don't write, I think they sometimes doubt this. Oh, there's the purple bottle. Thank mm -hmm. God. <laughs> right just with if you were waiting for it there's the bottle <laughs> there's the bottle um the thing i think surprises some people to hear is that in the mind of a writer these characters take on lives of their own sure uh, you create them and you put them on the page but then as you go from scene to scene and decide what happens to them or what they say next quite often the words that come out of their mouth come out of their mouth and you don't know where they came from mm. now, you're at the computer writing them but they 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 are they are unpredictable and they have lives of their own these characters and they don't always go where you thought they were going you the author they don't always go where you thought they were going to go but they but, but they stand up on their own and they say no i'm going over here and you finally you can't find it anymore so okay there you go okay <laughs> good luck to you um <laughs> right <laughs> and so Fascinating, because you're not, as the author, you're not in control. I mean, yes, you're the final editor, and you're going to finally say, you're you're out of here, or the next paragraph, I'm going to kill you off, or I'm going to I'm going to pair you up with uh, 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 the wrong person, and that's going to make you an unhappy person for many mm -hmm. people. Whatever. But these decisions are not always in your control. Um, the, 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 the story you're telling has a life of its own, and the characters have very real lives of their own, and you have to kind of manage it like a puppet master to some degree. Mm -hmm. it's, a very, it's, a very, it's a very satisfying element of writing because you're not sure when you sit down um, uh, midday, let's say, that's when I usually start writing. You're not sure what's going to happen. I think that's the, that's the element of, of writing with authenticity, though. Because cause you can tell. There are some writers, we're not going to name any names here, but you know who you are. They will take a character. You know, the thing is, they don't know who they are. And that's if they hear that, they'll be like, well, that's not me. I write very authentically. 
but they'll they'll take a character and they go, well, I want the character to do this. And there are times you'll read a character and you'll go, does that really fit with the character? It might fit for the story. It might make for the story a little better. It might make the story a little a little better, but it doesn't fit for the character. And uh, I didn't really have any place I was going with that, I guess, other than to say, you know, I, I think that's an, a big element of what makes an authentic writer versus uh, or a story that, that feels authentic versus a story that feels contrived. Yes. And I think the, I think the audience is spotted very quickly. Um, um, when you're watching a movie, let's say, or you're reading a book, um, um, you get drawn into it because you believe these people, whether yes. you like, them, you believe them. Right. And so they're taking you on a, on an, on an adventure that you believe. When the characters are just following a template that the author has made up, meaning you're going here no matter what, um, because that's what I've determined, um, and meaning they're not authentic, they're just robot characters who are doing what, you know, and they're saying words that are just, you know, fairly ridiculous, um, because the writers decided this is where he has to go, and these are the words he has to say to get there. Um, I think I think the the reader and the and the or the audience person in the movie theater, I think they spot it in a minute when they when they no longer believe. And that's quite often when you suddenly close the book and say, oh, I'm not going with this. This is this is silly. Yes. Um, now, granted, there are many, many, many best selling books that have these very same qualities, meaning there's a comfort level some audiences have with it not being surprising. Um, uh, there's a comfort sure. level that feels I can settle into this story. I know where this is going, so there are no surprises. And that's one kind of storytelling um, where you just kind of create comfort for the, for the, the audience. Um, but I don't know that any of us are, are turning to, to literature or movies for just comfort. I mean, we want to grow a little. We want to learn something. We want to fall in love. We want to... Um, um, we're not going to do that if, it's, if the author or the creator is just creating a comfortable atmosphere for us, as opposed to a real atmosphere. It's a good point. What about, I've never asked this question, so it's going to take me a second to articulate it. You have people now telling you they've fallen in love with these characters. Have you, have you had conversations where they mirrored back the people, people who have read the book mirror back the motivations, the desires, the, the identity, I guess, of these characters. And then you listen to it and you go, God, I never thought of that. Yeah, I guess that I guess that's that's part of that character. Do, let me stop talking. Do, have you experienced that? Um, I think if, if I understand what you're asking, um, there are people who have asked me who have read the book and were surprised by a few things. Uh, and when they described them to me, I was surprised, meaning that hadn't occurred to me. Yes, uh, that's what I'm asking. It's it's set in uh, the northwest, uh, the northeast kingdom of Vermont, um, which is a very rural area of Vermont, up by the Canadian border. And and some readers were surprised by how unsophisticated the area seemed to be, and how of another era it seems to be, because it's it's basically still an area of of, of of very little, there's not. It's not an area of plenty, um, and people are basically farming, um, and people are struggling to stay alive and to make a living, and it's very close to the earth. And there aren't a lot of stories set in that era at the moment. Um, yeah. And even if they are, they suddenly down the street they have an internet <laughs> connection or whatever. Seven right. Eleven, um, you know, you can go and get a Slurpee after the day. You know, it's and so. I, and I said to them, no, the Northeast Kingdom of Vermont exists. It's a real place. Now, granted, it's, 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 the book begins in the 1980s and then comes up to the present day. So that era, that area, the Northeast Kingdom in the 1980s and 90s um, 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 was, was very much, a, uh, it very much resembled the 1920s, the 1940s, the 60s, uh, meaning people were just going about their business and change wasn't really happening. Um, so yeah, some people questioned, some people questioned that they found that interesting. Um, there were some people, um, but that was mostly a joke. Some people thought the first sex scene took much too long to take place. 
<laughs> they said, why did they wait so long? I mean, we're talking teenagers here. <laughs> right. Uh, and I said, well, they had to grow up first. But anyway, no. They, uh, sorry, I don't have any more. I don't have any other examples for you. No, I, you know, I did a, another question that occurred to me. Why the area you're talking about, you said closer to the earth. And I think that's interesting. But you also begin the setting is is the 1980s. Right. So it was not a time. Well, it was a time in which information exchange was starting to explode. Certainly different from today where you, where you can just pick up, you know, your Craig supercomputer in your pocket and go, hey, what was that one, you know, fact to obscure factoid different in the 1980s. So what what drove the, um, the that choice of time? Um, I had bought land in that area um, um, in this in the 1970s, actually. Oh, OK built a cabin um, in, a, in an area that completely resembles the area that I describe in the book. And I, and I placed it there because it's, a, it's an unusual and beautiful area that the modern world has luckily left behind <laughs> to a large degree. Um, um, it's very rural. It's very beautiful. It's very natural. Um, there are mobile homes that sit on an acre of ugly land right next to a lovely mansion, well, not a mansion, but right next to an expensive home. Um, there might be a weekend home of a New Yorker, let's say, and they're all existent there um, together. Um, there, there's not like zoning going on to make sure to keep people of one ilk away from people of another ilk. I mean, meaning sure. that isn't what Vermont's about at all. Um, and so I, I just, I liked it as a setting. I liked it as a both as a as a as a as a as a mental atmosphere in which to set a story, but also as a physical um, environment that's very beautiful, and 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 that environment feeds these young characters as they're growing up. It very much it very much informs who they become. Um, they're people of they're people of the land of the earth, um, regardless of how, as they grow up and learn other things. This those qualities stay with them. Sure. So after the orth, sorry, I messed up the title. So after the orphan from Shepherd's Keep, what's next? What else is running through your head? Um, I'm working on a, on a story um, um, about healing, um, mm -hmm. um, different kinds of with characters who are involved as healers, um, both medical healers, um, metaphysical healers. Um, all the different kinds. I mean, I, again, I don't want to write a story that that's what it is, meaning the characters, that's what they're involved in. Um, um, and so that's still taking, that's still taking shape um, because we're at the moment, I don't know, I, I, if you watch television, three out of four commercials is for something that tells you there's something wrong with you. Oh, of you're course. Thick or you're this or you're itchy or your hair or you're, or you're whatever, whatever it is, you're not beautiful enough, you're not this enough, um, or you're coughing a lot, or you've got the sneezing, or you, whatever. Every commercial running on television now says you are a vulnerable human being, and, and you're not going to be here long unless you subscribe to our pills. Right. Uh, I think that's, a, I think that's you, you know, we are only one of two countries in the world that allows advertising of prescription medication. I didn't know that. I know very few people do. And there's a reason <laughs> there's a reason other countries don't want it. Um, but our Congress approved it and they've never studied the results of it. Um, and as a result, every other commercial is for, you know, what? Well, we see them all. It's just it's sure. it's it's harmful because you take that in and you think this is who I am as a human being. Right. Um, anyway, that's that's what I'm working on at the moment. OK. You know, in somewhat of a strange twist of irony, I know Congress has now said that advertising for things like alcoholic beverages and cigarettes, the things that we the things that we turn to because we feel so shitty after being told we've been sick from all the uh, advertisements about uh, that's regulated. But yes, you know, yes, the irony is, yeah, the irony is it's 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 hard to take. I mean, it is a miracle that they got tele uh, cigarettes off of television because th that generated huge amounts of money for mm -hmm. the 
that works. And people use the same argument saying you'll never win the battle to get rid of TV advertising of medication because it's the lodestar for the networks. So I said, well, they did it before they got rid of cigarettes. Now right. this, well, he said, well, how are you going to prove that medicine isn't good for you? And that's, that's, that's a harder, that's a harder bar to cross. That to is. <laughs> yeah, that yeah. is. I, although I think a lot of what I've been thinking about in terms of identity plays into that, the idea that we want to pathologize <clears throat> what is a common and frequent human experience. And we want to, well, you're sick or you're not sick, you know, and that's how we end up identifying ourselves in a sort of weird way. Yes. Yeah. So. You know, the, the, the accumulation of all this advertising, though, um, that's what has the impact. I mean, it's just it becomes the norm. Mm -hmm. um, um, and that's that's not that's not good. Um, um, the other the other norms that that advertising, though, has helped is they've peopled their commercials with actors who represent the entire spectrum of men and women um, um, on Earth. Uh, um, which never used to be true. Um, yeah. uh, and so you, you, you do get to see completely different kinds of families than necessarily might be in your realm of experience. And I, I, I always think I wasn't that's good. Representation um, yeah. even um, 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 is a good thing. I, I agree. I agree. It's been a couple of conversations recently with my friend Danny uh, right around that, you know, representation and marketing. So, Yes. I have somewhat of an off the cuff sort of question that occurred to me. You have been involved in stories your entire life. I happen to like role playing, which is somewhat of a form of improv. Do, do you, has that ever interested you? Are you good at like making up stories like right off the cuff and, and jumping into somebody else's story? I'm not going to ask you to jump into one. Like we're, you know, Whose line are, is it anyway? But it, is that something that uh, that's appealed to you that you want that you've done? Actually, no. Um, 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 meaning, I'm not good at it. Um, 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 improv, creating on the spot in the moment, um, and 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 I, I mean, I went to I went to um, I studied theater design in college, and so I was surrounded by young actors who were learning their crafts and young sure. directors their craft. And I would go to improv classes and watch um, um, these people, what the teachers were helping them to open up through improvisation. Um, and, and at that time, there were on Broadway, there were various um, Second City um, um, alumni creating wonderful story theater was a was a great hit on Broadway in the 19 golly, the late 1960s, I think. Um, but um, that's a very specific skill. Um, um, and I didn't feel I had it, um, meaning I can I create stories. I just don't create them on the spot or on the dime. Um, it takes me a while to create them. Um, it's the characters who lead me to the story, as opposed to the story leading me to the character. I have to create the people first, and they help me find the situation that would be best utilized to introduce them to the audience. But that takes a while. There are people who I mean, well, Robin Williams was one of the great. I mean, you could watch of him. Of course. You could say two words to him, and he would suddenly be able to spew forth 32 paragraphs of a wonderful story. I mean, there are people just really brilliant at it. Um, that is, um, I, I don't do that. I mean, with, with you do have to, with characters, when you suddenly have them in a scene, I mean, yes, I have them, I hear them in my head talking to one another, um, and I sometimes will shoot down something saying, no, that doesn't sound like something he would say. Um, or what would you say in this situation? And you have to work on that. Some people are faster at that and quicker at that than I am. Um, I rewrite like crazy and I read it aloud to myself to see if it still has the ring of truth to it. And when I don't, and I, when I don't hear truth, I just go, Ooh, how did I ever write that? Um, so I, 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 re, I do a great deal of rewriting. You, you just moved your hand when you said, if it doesn't sound, do you write? Longhand first? No, I did my first time when I wanted to be a writer since I was since I was a teenager. And yes, I, and a dear friend of mine, because I didn't know how to type then. A dear friend of mine, she could type, so she would take my pages and type them up. But um, um, 
No, I don't write longhand at all. It's it's very time consuming. <laughs> Computers, well, Word, well, play, you know, Microsoft Word is just a miracle. Um, um, how fast you can re- rewrite something, how fast mm-hmm. you can insert a paragraph from here over to here. It's, um, um, no, there's no reason to deny the ease with which computers, the ease they brought to the uh, the art of writing. There was a the, the Ken Burns documentary on Ernest Hemingway. And within that documentary, he shot uh, pages, Hemingway's pages with his handwriting and, and they're typed, they're typed pages, but then in his handwriting, he's making changes to it. And, and you see sure. these pages on screen. And I thought, oh, my God, imagine every change I made, if it had to be done like this, it would take forever. Um, but that's, of course, how rewrites were done. Um, the writer would have it, would write on, on a typewriter and then start writing in the margins. This is the wrong word. This doesn't right. sound. Um, computers make that so much easier. <laughs> they, they do. There is a. Because I love writing longhand with a uh-huh. fountain pen, for that what? matter. Oh, so there is something about the flow of ink. I don't even know how to describe it. There is a sensuality and a, and a, and a vi- viscerality. Is that a word I want to use? The word I want to use? Is it right. even a word? That's the question. But the, the, you are so close to the writing that it's, I don't know. I've only done this for journaling. So it's not like I've written, you know, well, I, it's articles, I guess I'll typically Nowadays, I've been writing articles longhand first. It's just, let me think about this, you know, think about this in my head, and then I'll transcribe it and then go, boy, that was a terrible thought, and then rewrite it on a computer. But yeah, there's there's an honesty. That's the word I want to use. There is an honesty to using a pen and, and committing a word to paper and going, I'm going to go with that word for now. Um Again, I don't know where that was going to take us, but but uh, that was a curious question. So now there, there are habits. I mean, I write on the computer, um, but I don't like reading on the computer at all. Mm, but yes. when I when I've done when I've written a fair amount, I'll have to print it out, and then I have to read it as if it is a book, um, yeah. and it's on page. And then with a pen, I will indeed write in the margins a new sentence, or this might sure. be better. And so, so it's it's incorporating all of it. The computer itself, I just find it a useful tool, but oh, not, yeah. not not as not as I don't I don't like reading on the computer at all. Agreed, agreed. Um, if I can make just one observation, because you had said the facility. Oh, how did you put it? You said that that your your ability to make up stories on the spot was was not. That you, that you didn't have good facility with making it up on the spot. It it took you a while to to see a story, and just an observation from you know some purple hair bins. You know, take it for for what uh, what you will. I look back at your career, and clearly you can see a good story, whether it took you a while or not. And I don't know if it made a difference. Whether, you know, I I don't know how I wanted to say this other than, you know, I'm looking at your career and there's no way you could say that, uh, you know, your ability to see to see a a bigger picture doesn't exist. That, you know, yeah, there's a skill in doing it, but the big skill is saying yes and and leaning into something. And I'm looking at your career and your whole career is a big yes and. Yeah, thank you. Yes, um, um, the thing, the thing that people would, um, you know, in the film and television business, young writers get taught how to pitch a story. Sure, they get told, okay, you're going to go meet with an executive or a producer, and you want to tell him or her the story that you would like them to help finance, and this is how you're going to do it. We're going to show you how to pitch a story. And and there are workshops on you know that you that writers pay for to teach you how to pitch and all yeah. and I was so against it um, uh, as a producer because in the end they would say well how do you, you you don't want people to come in and pitch a story I said no that doesn't tell me anything my grandfather could tell a great story that doesn't mean he's a talented writer 
It just means he was a good, he could tell a story, but sure. I, you know, does he have anything to say? And they said, well, how do you do it then? I said, I just invite a writer to come in and talk. We just talk about whatever, the, what, what, perhaps today's headlines in the news. We just talk. And is anything that writer is saying, is any of it interesting? Mm-hmm. If it's really completely common um, and there's no surprise in the conversation, if nothing that writer says surprises me or throws me or gets my attention, um, then, okay, well, maybe we don't need to work together. But if that person, you know, has me on my toes because I can I can hardly keep up um, um, with his train of thought or her leaping from subject to subject, if I'm struggling to hold on, then I want, I want, it, I want more from that person. Um, so let's give that person, I mean, this is back when we would commission stories. Let's give that person some money and develop this into a story. Yeah. And that's what the story that they told me that had me finance it. It was who they were and how they came across as people that would make me want to finance the story and see what they had to say. And they didn't always work, of course, but um, um, but but that's how I, I that's how I used to make choices, and I, and knowing that I still when I look at myself I think okay let's make sure what happens happens I mean uh, people some again some of the letters I've gotten regarding the book they had no idea where it was going, um, um, and that's a good thing I mean some mm-hmm. some you suddenly think oh I know exactly where this is going now that's fine I'm I'm along for the ride I'll enjoy that. But that's that's not at all what this book does. It's it's it it takes you on a surprising journey, and you don't see what's coming ahead of you at all. I wish there were more executive producers like you. This is why we have classes about pitching, right? You know, well, not me. I was a chemist. What the hell do I know? But uh, uh, I mean, yeah, the thirty second pitch. That's the big thing. Yes. Right. The elevator pitch, sorry, the elevator pitch. So, oh, the pain I, of, yeah. Yes, I think that it's is, just that is how that world is run these days. I'm, 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 and that's that's too bad. But mm-hmm. the people who aren't good at that or who don't do that, um, they can they can survive too, though. Um, they just yeah. they, they don't fit into that mold. But their 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 originality or their truthfulness in their storytelling. I, I'm convinced it it come it rises to the top also. I hope so. Because yeah. I'm terrible at an elevator pitch. It took us an hour and two minutes for me to ask, all, at this point, for me to ask all the questions. But, you know, people have asked me, well, what's your elevator pitch? And I'm like, uh, well, I got to ask you a few questions first. And I'm like, no, 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 no. It doesn't work. And I go, yeah. well, then hard to... You know, hard hard to say. Um, Again, it just, guess... just comes down to the fact that we're all wildly different from one another, um, and that's a wonderful thing, not a scary. Mm-hmm. Um, oh, and no. take away that which makes us different. <clears throat> that's just the biggest mistake there is. So, I agree, and and that's why you know when I when I was you know trying to think of how to how to to sum up anything <clears throat> you know. I tried to put his telling stories of the uncommon human experience, but stories that must be told. And I, I, you know, that was, that was the best I could do justice to your career. I hope that was okay. But We're just fine. Thank you. Good. Yeah. Good. <clears throat> so Lindsay, can you tell us where, um, where to find you? Um, for what I have a website, um, I mean, it's lindsaylaw.net, L I N D S A Y. L-A-W dot net. And that tells you a lot about me. Um, um, I write a blog at least once a month on there about writing. Um, and those can, that, that can be interesting, I hope, for some people. Um, also, there are links on there to be able to go and buy the book. Because, of course, um, my book is self-published, which is a whole other universe at the moment. It yes. um, doesn't have a big, huge publisher behind it. Um, to get it into bookstores. So it's it's self-published, which means, um, 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 for the most part, the easiest way to purchase the book is to just go on Amazon. And it's available on Kindle. It's available as a paperback. And it's available as a hardcover. Um, and all of that's on Amazon. Um, in Connecticut, I've gone to several local bookshops um, um, because they're near me, and they're covering, they're carrying it as a book. And I've written to about 30 different 
gay bookstores and sent them a free copy of the book, hoping they'll read it and order copies for them. I just I want to get it into more bookstores. Um, um, and the way to do that, you know, with Amazon, it's all about analytics. On Amazon, I've got to get more people to go to Amazon and write comments to say, yes, this is good. Yes. Oh, that's how they get friends to do that. You've got to, you know, please go on and, and rate the book because that's how this modern world works. Analytics, a terrible word, but there yes. we are. Right. <laughs> well, so, I mean, I urge everybody, Lindsay, frankly, I have not yet read your book because we met pretty quickly. I didn't have the chance. Um, but your your blog is fascinating, no doubt. Um, I have an Instagram link, too. Does it, you know, I, there, there's... Yes. Go ahead. Uh, I mean, for me, I mean, I, yes. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Not for me. No, it was, yeah. yeah Your no, Instagram. Lindsay dot law. Yeah. Is, um, um, yes. I, I, Instagram's fun. I find it much more fun than Facebook um, oh, because gosh, yeah. it doesn't require anything from you. You can just yeah. look at it. i look at it. Um, yeah. And there's great photography on it. There's great architecture on it I, and, and great recipes. <laughs> Very true. <laughs> so anyway, I, I have fun with it. Yeah. So, so I have not read this, but, but I, I, you know, based on your other writing, you know, I'm certainly going to urge anybody listening, you know, The Orphan from Shepherd's Keep by Lindsay Law, um, available on Amazon. Um, but gosh, I, I will tell you, Lindsay, I mean, I don't know when, when we, when we first connected and I saw the work that you had done and how so much of it like fed my life um I, it's, all i can say is thank you thank you for your time thank you for your career um just you know thank you for being the person you are thank you for having me on today and it's um um those are those are those are words that are dear to my heart i i that's why all of us do the things we do hoping it yeah. reaches so the fact that some of my work has reached you as an audience person that's very fulfilling so thank you and good Those, to meet and good to uh, see the bottle too <laughs> <laughs> it's right yeah you did get to see the purple bottle yep. um those words are too small they did not your your work did not touch me your your work helped create me and and that's um yeah it's very big so um well well you know we're we're out of time so i will say I am Amethysta Herrick. I'm speaking with Lindsay Law on Gender Identity Weekly, and we were talking about fiction, particularly in the LGBTQ genre, and uh, how it informs our lives and the lives of the rest of the world. Thank you again, Lindsay. Thank you. Bye-bye.